In this episode, I am once again joined by Ralph White, holistic learning pioneer, international speaker on cultural transformation and the history of the Western esoteric tradition, and co-founder of the New York Open Center. Ralph reflects on his decades at the center of the American spirituality and human potential movements, and discusses the life and works of figures such as poet Robert Bly, Ram Dass, Colin Wilson, R. D. Lang, and Rupert Sheldrick and tells personal anecdotes of his time spent with each. Ralph also reflects on today's psychedelic renaissance, the pros and cons of AI, and why he is more motivated than ever before to bring about an enlightened cultural shift. So without further ado, Ralph White. Ralph White, welcome back to the podcast. Pleasure to be here, Steve. I'm so delighted to be talking with you again. We had two very interesting episodes indeed about your life and adventures, the last one being Mission to Tibet, involving sneaking into Tibet uh, on a secret mission, spotting some kind of UFO, who knows what it was. I suppose by definition, you don't know what it is. And uh, all sorts of wild adventures, uh, escaping bandits and commissars, etc. Quite remarkable episodes we've, we've had these last two, and very popular they've been also. And today, you have generously agreed to discuss a, something of a rogues gallery. A rogues, you have been at the center of the, I don't know what we could call it, spirituality, um, uh, human flourishing, human potential movement for many, many decades, actually, in your role in the open center and uh, similar sorts of places. And in that time, you've come across all kinds of interesting characters, really pretty much anybody in that period of time. You've, you've known them from some, to some degree or another. And we had sort of playfully discussed pulling back the curtain of the spiritual presentation to find out who these people really were. And we were discussing before we began, where should we start? And the person that came to my mind, first of all, was Robert Bly. Robert Bly, who died in 2021, poet, uh, storyteller, troublemaker, and someone who you knew very well indeed. You write about him here. Though most of his obituaries mention his leadership of the men's movement after the enormous success of his book on the fairy tale of Iron John, it was his deep spiritual attunement and soulfulness that stay with me. He was a vital part of the Open Center's Esoteric Quest conferences in Bohemia, Florence, Andalusia, and elsewhere, and would always take the audience to a deeper place with his hypnotic recitations of poems. He liked to make sure that we grasped the subtlety and insight of each line. I met him when I was program director of Omega Institute, which is, uh, which is upstate New York. It's about an hour and a half north of New York City in the Hudson Valley. I ran the first two summers there. Uh, back, you know, the programs uh, that summer of, what was that, 80, 81, 82, or 82, 83. Um, yeah, that's how I met him. Uh, I had, I asked him to come in and uh, just, you know, he lived in Minnesota, so he had to fly in um, to really cover the whole world of mythology and fairy tale. That's really what he began to be come well known he, he was a brilliant storyteller he would put on masks he could growl he had this fierce element you know robert bly came across to most people as a sort of curmudgeonly individual <laughs> he did have a sort of a hard side but to me that was just covering up his extreme sensitivity he was an extremely uh, sensitive deep brilliant uh, soulful individual so I knew him really from the many brilliant uh, poetry readings he did. You know, he single-handedly transformed the concept of a poetry reading in America. You know, I remember going to poetry readings, and then some of them were terribly tedious, just people standing up there and people sipping sherry or something. And I remember that from university. But Robert Bly made it fully alive. Um, he would really repeat the lines until you really got where the great... It wasn't just his own poetry, but it was the great Sufi poets 
roomy affairs. In fact, he, he was he and Coleman Barks became an, an honorary degree in Iran for their work on bringing the great Sufi, Sufi poets back. Um, and Antonio Machado and some of the great Spanish poets too. Uh, he was enormously well versed in the whole world of literature, but never from some you know fancy literary perspective. It was all about soul and authenticity um, and depth and heart. Uh, he was also a very politically uh, engaged and perceptive person. You know, he he was a leader in the opposition to the war of the, the war in Vietnam. Uh, he was a person of really astute political insights. He did not suffer fools gladly on the political front. And, um, yeah, he, he was a cultural critic. You know, he wrote a book called The Sibling Society, um, as well as I and John. These, these, he, he, he was a brilliantly insightful cultural critic, a, a, politi a courageous political leader, and a man of enormous uh, poetic and spiritual depth and integrity, I would say. As I said in that little piece that you uh, read from there, uh, most of his obituaries did refer to uh, Iron John and the, the men's work. I personally was never very involved with that. I mean, I, I saw a few presentations on it and I, I'm supportive of it, but uh, it wasn't what drew me. It was really his work as a great poet and um, well, he's one of the great live performers I've ever seen. And he would definitely, I can remember one episode in particular in a sort of underground system in Prague. You know, he came to many of the esoteric conferences that I've done. You know, I do these esoteric conferences on um, rediscovering the lost spiritual history of the West. In fact, there's going to be one coming up in September in Iceland. We're going to do the Mysteries of the North Part Three. Maybe we can get some guru Vikings up there, Steve. <laughs> we love the Mysteries of the North up in Iceland. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he. I remember him giving this uh, fabulous reading in some underground chamber in Prague. And, I mean, you know, it was just one of those palpably elevated states. Everybody was in an altar state. Everybody was in their heart. Um, nobody was doing any kind of substance that would generate an altered state. It was purely through the power of his, uh, of his poetic invocation. So, yeah, Robert Bly was a truly great man. And, uh, you know, he could be off-putting to people because he did have this sort of gruff exterior. But uh, he was a sweetheart and um, a lovely, lovely, uh, and a brilliant man. And I had great respect for him. And, you know, in terms of open set of teachers, I miss on a personal level. I'm, I really miss Robert. He was a real source of uh, spiritual strength for me for many years. What do you mean by that, that he was a source of spiritual strength to you? I think he, uh, his clarity, his courage, his incisive mind, his um, outspokenness about cultural, political, social things. Um, he did a great session with called Deborah Tannen on how men and women communicate differently to each other. Uh, he just pioneered a lot of things, and he was just always... You could always rely on him as a source of rough, insightful integrity. And he never, you know, he just was a person of enormous um, inner strength and integrity, I would say. That was, that's mainly it. Yeah. From where do you think he got that depth of integrity and insight? Oh, I just think it's who, who he was. I mean, you know, he was, I think he grew up in Minnesota. I think he had an alcoholic father. You know, he was of Norwegian background, as so many people are up in the Northlands, like Minnesota. Um, I think it was, you know, he was in the Second World War. I think he was in the Merchant uh, Marine. Um, then he was in Harvard. After that, he was a totally brilliant student at Harvard. And he was to say, although he never mentioned it to anybody. Um, I don't know. I just think, you know, he knew some of those early poets before the whole holistic spiritual ecological impulse really arose he dated to a previous time um i think he was just born with it he he was just a person of real substance you mentioned yeah. coleman barks and often i think coleman barks and robert bly are thought of in association with each other because of their work on Rumi, as you say and yeah, yeah, um, absolutely could be. Uh, yeah many of the great mystical poets of both india and uh and uh, the Islamic world, yeah. Absolutely. Do you uh, have a particular favorite 
supply poem or piece? I don't know the lines well enough to quote them, but I, I would say some of his. What's I've got a book there? The Angels at the Tavern Door. I have a book of his just in my living room over there. That's a that's a quote from Rumi, I think. And uh, you know, the that line summarizes a lot of what Robert. The, yes, the angels, the spiritual, the transcendent is totally there, but the tavern door is also right there. And uh, I don't think those angels are discouraging people from going in the tavern and sinking a few glasses of, uh, of wine. <laughs> Although you can look at wine in uh, lots of different symbolic ways. But that's a phrase that, you know, and what, uh, what do you call it? A rag and bone shop of the heart was another one of his collections. Hmm. Uh he was a very embodied person, you know, I and mean, it was very much in this world. It wasn't airy fairy transcendence, uh, very conscious, aware, embodied, alive person with issues. Anybody who has an alcoholic father is going to have issues. Yes, indeed. One of my favorites of his is the spiritual athlete. Well, it's a translation of Kabir. Do you know that one? I don't. Well, you're a, you're a spiritual athlete, aren't you? You're a martial well, artist, and this as well as uh, well, you know, artist. it actually lampoons that idea. Uh, if I can recall it, it's something like the spiritual athlete often changes the color of his robes, but mine remain gray and loveless. He sits inside the shrine room all day, so that God has to go out and praise the rocks. He drills holes in his ears, and his beard grows enormous and matted. People mistake him for a goat. And he goes into wilderness places, and he strangles his impulses, and he makes himself neither male nor female. He shaves his head, puts his robe into an orange vat, reads the Bhagavad Gita and becomes a terrific talker. Kabir says, Actually, you're going in herds to the country of the land of death, bound hand and foot. Yeah, well, that is a great poem. <laughs> We've all come across people, <laughs> at least I have. But yeah, I mean, well, that summarizes too a lot of Robert. He wasn't into baloney, you know, a highfalutin spiritual. People are self-consciously spiritual. And like you say, he was, a, he was a grounded, embodied person. So I can, and he was irreverent, definitely irreverent towards uh, the political classes, the various strutting and preening politicians of the day. <laughs> he had an acid gaze on them. So yes, I, I think that uh, irreverent and um, insightful and humorous approach that Kabir had, <laughs> I can see why Bly would have uh, selected that as one of his favorite poems. Yeah. If that it was that one of his anthologies, or was it just was it just a Kabir poem? Uh, it's a Kabir poem. Um, I don't recall which it's which oh, it's from. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever it was, it was it's of his ilk. Oh, certainly, Kabir. Certainly. Yeah. What name comes next to mind? Is there someone associated with Robert, or perhaps someone even quite different to him? in England over there, but you know, I, I'm thinking about this, I thought of some of the uh, English uh, presenters I have known, although I, I gather your audience says that you have a big audience in America too. Um, but you know, somebody I, I, in the early days of the Open Center, which is the 80s, the, the second half of the 80s, I took a lot of pleasure in bringing people over from Britain to America who hadn't been in many years. And um, one of them was Colin Wilson. Although I gather he's not so well known as he, Colin Wilson was the enfant terrible of uh, English literature in the 1950s. He wrote a book called The Outsider, um, which was proclaimed as a brilliant existential work. Uh, he, he wrote it while sleeping rough in Hyde Park or some other park in London, <laughs> so going into the British Museum, and people loved it. Um, uh, but then he got later in his life into all kinds of spiritual and esoteric things. He wrote a book on Abraham Maslow, the great psychologist. He wrote a book on the occult. He, he did all kinds, you know, he was a free thinking person. 
and I, I did bring him over to uh, to New York, and it was, I found him really lovely. He was a charming guy. I mean, I remember the obituary that there was in the Guardian for Colin Wilson. It was a disgrace. It was one of the nastiest, um, most offensive, uh, you know, just arrogant, total dismissal of this guy's work because he was into anything mystical and spiritual. As we know, the the English intellectual and literary establishment doesn't like people like that. And of course, with people like Rupert Sheldrake, they don't like the science. The scientific establishment doesn't like it either. Um, but uh, yeah, Colin Wilson was a, I don't know how many of our audience would know about him, so maybe we don't stay much longer on him, but he, he was a prolific author on all kinds of topics to do with consciousness, spirituality, he was deeply into Gurdjieff. He explored the kind of topics that were not acceptable within the establishment and was vilified for it. Um, and uh, But he, you know, he lived down in Cornwall, he did his own thing. He was, you know, he was a sort of kind of a working class guy from the Midlands who'd left school at 15 and was self-educated, but was sharp as a tack. Anyway, I just remember him as um, a, a humble guy, a modest guy, a fun bloke who liked to drink, uh, unpretentious, and with an amazingly uh, comprehensive mind. Um, so I have a soft spot in my heart for Colin Wilson. I didn't agree with everything he wrote, but uh, he was so incredibly prolific. It's rare to agree with everything everybody writes, but... Um, Anyway, he sticks out in my mind, but uh, I just don't, maybe he's so far gone, you know, that, I mean, of course, I had him here I, in New York in the 80s, <laughs> and uh, that was already in the latter part of his career, but for the Brits, he was really a pioneering figure, and I I recommend that uh, people look at some of his books, because um, he was a very clear-sighted uh, person and way ahead of his time, who wasn't hidebound by uh, establishment prejudices. And I think of him as a real, as a forerunner of, um, of the whole consciousness impulse, shall we call it. Yeah, the Outsider is, of course, the original one that he wrote, which included all kinds of figures that are not normally part of the literary canon. Um, I particularly always enjoyed his book on Abraham Maslow, you know, the person who created the... Uh, the hierarchy of human needs. Uh, you look at somewhere like China today, where hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, and you see it does, it's not covered, covered much in the media, but there's an enormous spiritual awakening happening in China because you've got people lifted up, as Maslow said, out of subsistence. Um, and when you get make it out of subsistence, people start to engage with larger questions like, like self-actualization and so on. And certainly, I haven't been back to China for about five years, but I've been stunned by the uh, the number of people, young, educated, traveled uh, women, that they are mostly, who um, who have share all the same spiritual and philosophical interests that we do. And um, to me, that's such a living illustration of, uh, of Maslow's work. So anyway, I, I, would, I would definitely recommend Colin Wilson's book on on Maslow. I mean, I, I think he, he he produced such a range of books that I think that uh, just see see what just go go. I, I know been to his Wikipedia page, but it probably has a list of them there, and just see which one draws you. But he's he's an engaging, um, direct writer. Somebody else that comes to mind when I'm thinking of Brits is uh, R. D. Lang. You know, the uh, the celebrated uh, psychiatrist R.D. Lang, who was a uh, brilliant guy, <laughs> uh, extraordinary man. I, I remember him giving, uh, still probably my favorite title for a workshop given at the Open Center, Wisdom, Madness, and Folly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I remember him doing a, a magnificent critique of the, uh, the, the manual, the psychiatric manual that diagnoses every imaginable psychiatric malady as a disorder of some sort, the DMA or is it the DSMA, whatever it's called. So um, he just took that apart, deconstructed it perfectly as a sort of a fatuous operation. But, you know, he was a, he was a true, like Robert Blyden, you know, these people were really, they were super smart and they were extremely penetrating thinkers. 
And uh, they saw through a lot of the hypocrisy, shallowness, idiocy of the contemporary world. I mean, you know, Lang was a bit of a wild man. <laughs> and uh, he certainly adopted some extreme positions. But, um, yeah, I once found myself, uh, <laughs> uh, he had... Um, he was doing something at the open center. And so I, I took him out for dinner in Greenwich village and, uh, Adi Lang had a call, you know, he had a drinking problem essentially. And he was a different person after a glass of red wine. And we met, we were walking the streets of the village. And there was a guy who had a little secondhand bookstore down in a basement. And he was clearly, you know, somebody not somebody a bit out of balance psychologically. So I thought, well, look. And so when we came out of the basement, I said to Lang, I tried to find a way to say, well, get his, what's Lang's response to meeting somebody who is clearly mentally ill, for want of a better word. And like, he took it, except for that one glass of red wine, he took it as that I had some kind of critique of that guy, which I didn't. And it's like, we got into an argument. I said, you do not want to be an argument with our deal. <laughs> You know, he was super, I mean, there was absolutely nothing you could say that could, uh, could change his mind. He was a bit of a, you know, well, he, he, you know, he had some of that fierce in your face, Scottish uh, argumentativeness after he'd had a drink or two. <laughs> I'll never forget. We healed it. We wound up, you know, but it it wound up. It was actually one of the more tense dinners I've ever had with uh, anybody. But you see, you, you know, he was just triggered by that remark I made about this, you know, mentally unbalanced person. But I don't think he would have been if he hadn't had a glass or two of wine. So if if I had ever had dinner, I think that was the last time I had dinner with him, but we would have steered clear of the booze. You know, I think he was pretty upfront about having a drinking problem. So, uh, yeah, but, but he was a brilliant, brilliant man, you know, who took apart psychiatric establishment and saw underneath it all. Do I subscribe to all his theories? No, but, um, but I think he was a, a necessary iconoclast and a courageous person. I think all of these guys, you know, Colin Wilson, Robert Fly, Radi Lang, they were all very courageous. You know, they started their work in the 50s, maybe even earlier in the 40s. <clears throat> you know, in the aftermath of the war, in that gray world of post-war Britain. And um, it must have been very lonely. You know, they were insightful people who could see through the superficiality of post-war consumer society and uh, they deserve they all deserve a lot of respect in my opinion you mentioned the spirit in britain of skepticism towards esoteric things spiritual things however you want to say it or even too much self improvement actually in any sense um uh, no, no. True. and the uh the loss of credibility that goes along with an interest in that. If you're in a professional field, you're an academic or something like that. Yeah. I wonder about the difference you've observed. What sort of difference? Is there a difference in the uh, attitudes in the US? My instinct is that there's something of a greater openness to that, but there is still something a little bit discrediting about too much of an interest in those things. And it seems when that interest is pursued, for example, meditation research, it has to be couched in very, uh, say, neuroscience. The neuroscience of meditation has to be stripped of its mystery, uh, which, of course, isn't necessarily a problem. It's uh, perhaps that's a good thrust of the scientific endeavor. But it seems to be, let's see if we can justify these things or correlate these things or validate these things through some sort of physical structure in the brain or some sort of process, hormonal process, or whatever the case may be. Um, I wonder, do you do you see a difference in the British and uh, American ways of approaching this whole area of of mystery and the esoteric, particularly in academia? See, I'm you know I have lived in Britain in many years, so I'm much more familiar with America. Um, but yes, just take I was just in touch with Rupert Sheldrake, for instance, who was a prime example of this. You know, when he wrote his first books suggesting there might be something beyond scientific materialism. What was it? One of the big magazines, science magazines in Britain, 
literally said this is a candidate for burning. I mean, that he was heretical. He was not buying into scientific materialism. You know, and the way Rupert has been uh, attacked and vilified is really quite disgusting. Um, and, you know, I, the Open Center honored Rupert. I remember when we gave him my little rap about Rupert. I mean, he's shown up like a courage. I think, you know, Rupert has had a lot of courage to face down these kinds of attitudes. And I think for Rupert being able to come to places like the Open Center or elsewhere in California and America, where there's a great deal more receptivity to his more, uh, what should we say, more spiritual perception of the world has been very nourishing for him. I just saw him give a great talk. Uh, on YouTube, which I recommend to everybody. It's his first talk speaking about psychedelics called Psychedelics and Consciousness at the University of Sussex Psychedelic Society about three weeks ago. I went to the University of Sussex in the 60s, so that's my old alma mater, as they say in America. So I was thrilled to see him there, and I thought he did a great job. So yes, you know, Rupert has been, uh, uh, I think, really attacked pretty ruthlessly for his uh, his embrace of, for his recognition that the, this, the materialistic worldview is really pretty fatuous and pretty superficial. Of course, all that work he's done, scientific experiments that disprove the material world conception, you know, dogs that know when their owners are coming home, the feeling of that you have when people are looking at you from behind. I mean, he's done countless simple experiments that have shown this. And um, so I do think, yes, I noticed, too, that when uh, I've been, I, one of my friends and colleagues is a guy called uh, Tony Bosses here in New York, who is the New York University principal investigator of the use of psilocybin with stage four cancer patients dealing with what they call existential distress or intense fear of death. And uh, I talked to him about this, you know, the when you write up the reports from all the scientific studies it's more acceptable to reference mystical states of consciousness in america the stuff that has been going on in imperial college london because there is a certain amount of stuff going on in england it all has to be couched in much more reserved terms um anything mystical in in the establishment in the scientific establishment in britain seems to call people's credibility into question. So that's why I really honor Rupert. But I think for Rupert, it's been very, I mean, he could speak for himself. I've ever had him on the show, but uh, he could, um, I think it's true. I've never discussed this with him, but I think he's got a lot of spiritual strength and, and uh, encouragement from the, the much broader, more receptive audience he received in America. Oh, I've no doubt there's lots of wonderful people in the UK that, don't share the views of the uh, scientific establishment. But he's another pioneer. And uh, of course, he's got all the credentials. I mean, you couldn't have more scientific credentials than Rupert. So, uh, but he's a brave man. And I think being increasingly vindicated. And of course, his son, his son, his son Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> who would name, who else would name their sons Merlin and Cosmo? <laughs> But, you know, Merlin, of course, has turned into a leading world expert on the mycelium and on, on mushrooms and their extraordinary powers. And not He, he honors, you know, the magical dimension of them, but it's much more than that. They're, they're a phenomenon that we need to engage with in reconnecting with the Earth. I think one of the other credibility detonators that can happen is, is psychedelic use. Now, of course, of a certain generation, Pretty difficult to find. I think it was for a long time quite a bit a dirty secret, actually, in meditation teaching circles and in academic circles. Certainly in the states, it was it was not spoken about and actively denied. And then over you know maybe in the last fifteen years or so, twenty years maybe, it started to come out more. A little bit like the old bodybuilders have started to admit, you know, their their that their Mr. Olympia performances may you know were enhanced by steroids and whatever the case may be, performance enhancing drugs. There, it, it's starting to pop out of those that generation of meditation teachers as if anyone uh, you know didn't realize it but they preached hard against it and denied it strongly many of them so i think that's an interesting sea change but anyway certainly uh, it was something that threatened one's credibility psychedelic use yeah. or and now it's complete. I mean, now there is not a week that goes by without another article on psychedelics in the New York Times or the Guardian 
or you know some significant work you know quality magazine it's everywhere i mean you know right now the california institute of integral studies is offering two nine-month trainings in psychedelic psychotherapy and each cohort one in san francisco the other in boston has 200 participants so that's 400 people being trained right now in psychedelic psychotherapy and the new york times that was it the times or the guy i think it was the times that just did a whole interview with janice phelps who runs i know who runs their program i mean it's you know and of course you can there's now ketamine therapy available legally on the streets of new york and so on um so yes this is a massive change and people of course the downside in america america tries to turn everything into money you've now got 400 for-profit corporations trying to make money off psychedelics of course which is that's the dark side of america isn't it but yes this is uh this has all been kept underground people have had because of the the idiotic war on drugs i mean look look, look at what it's doing in mexico the huge gang murders in mexico that are going on all to do with the war on drugs but unfortunately you know we are coming out of it here and uh so yes it's uh, I, I think that's there's a phenomenal history there and it got rammed us we think of the origins of it i mean i don't know how many our younger audience may not remember that Ram Das, his real name was uh, Richard Alpert, and he and Timothy Leary, they were psychology professors at Harvard. And, <laughs> and they were doing quite brilliant work there. And then I think was it was, I think Timothy Leary or somebody came back from Mexico with some magic mushrooms. And um, anyway, they started that yes, nobody would say this was very ethical now, but they, what do they call it? The Harvard Psychedelic Club with brilliant people like Houston Smith, who went on to be one of the world's leading scholars of world religion. They were participants in it. And but they gave some psychedelics to some of their students at Harvard. <laughs> I know some of the students. And uh, they were booted out. And uh, and of course, they went on, you know, Timothy Leary wound up Richard Nixon called Timothy Leary, the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> and Ram Dass went to India and met his guru and became a spiritual teacher. And I don't think he ever lost his affection for psychedelics <laughs> from what I hear over these years because he had a stroke and lived his latter years out in Hawaii. But uh, those guys were real pioneers. And I remember, you know, when I was setting out on the spiritual path, I was living in Vancouver. I'd left graduate school in Chicago, wanted to move to the West Coast so that I could explore the spiritual path more deeply. And... Uh, yeah, I just remember what it was like out there. I remember reading, you know, Be Here Now, the classic Be Here Now by Ram Dass had just come out in 1971. And I remember feeling very alone, thousands of miles from home. I knew nobody in Vancouver there because I, I wanted to go more deeply into the spiritual path, which seemed absurd in 1971. And Ram Dass's book was just phenomenal. And I was very pleased that at a later point, when he spoke at one of the Open Center's Art of Dying conferences, Spiritual, Scientific, and Practical Approaches to Living and Dying, I was able to thank him for that wonderful bibliography that there is at the back of Be Here Now, and um, which was a real source of uh, guidance for me in what to read in this whole worldview. But, you know, Ram, Ram Dass was... Uh, I say about Ram Dass. He was a, you know, he was a wild and crazy guy. He was a sweetheart. He was, uh, he wasn't devoid of ego. I mean, who is? But uh, he was a very likable person. I, I wouldn't describe Ram. I, I've met my share, as you can imagine, of prima donnas who uh, present a certain face to the world <laughs> and and have a uh, prima donna like sub personality. But you know, Ram Dass was the real thing, and. Um, a sweet bit of funny he was funny he had a great sense of humor and uh yeah he didn't take himself too seriously and he had an, an enormous gift of natural eloquence and um he was always engaging and he was all you know i used to think about ram das as the new in the so-called new age <laughs> when he used to be around he was kind of the new age's great neurotic because Ram Dass had had every imaginable neurosis and being a psychologist and being a self-aware person, he was very, um, 
he was very upfront about revealing his own neurotic tendencies. And then he made humor out of that. And then he turned that into some kind of spiritual teaching. So, yeah, I was, I mean, everybody was fond of Brown Bass, really. He was, you know, for my generation, you know, he, because he did, you know, the psychedelic thing and he went to India and he met a guru and he came back. I mean, he was a kind of, you know, uh, an enormous figurehead. Timothy Leary sort of went off and did his own wild and crazy thing. Um, all honor and respect to Timothy Leary as a pioneer. But um, Ram Dass was the one who actually embraced a more a coherent spiritual path, of course. So for him, it was, you know, yoga and the Hindu world worldview. But uh, anyway, he was a good guy, Ram Dass. I miss him too. Yeah. Do you think the psychedelic revolution in the 60s, I mean, it's a rather hypothetical question, really. Was it net good or net negative? Oh, unquestionably, unquestionably net good. And I see in my mouth, obviously there's a downside to it, of course, the people who freaked out and the Sid Barrett's and, you know, and so on of this world who, you know, lost it through, I, I certainly knew people who did too much in the way of psychedelics because, you know, now in the, well, we have a psychedelic renaissance going on right now in America and I think the world in general because it's being studied meticulously and scientifically under control conditions. Like I mentioned, uh, my friend Tony Bossis at NYU, who is researching um, existential distress, people dying, people with terrible fear of death, who you know will do a, a carefully controlled dose of psilocybin set and setting with a therapist there after screening with beautiful music, etc. And this is, I mean, when you look back on the 60s, you know, and I mean, the, in the 70s, the early 70s, it was, you know, people just did it by themselves. And uh, whether it's ideally in some kind of beautiful natural setting, but sometimes at parties and things like that, this is not, you know, these are sacred substances. And I think that um, it is remarkable that so many people emerged intact. I mean, you know, the John Lennon and George Harrison could have emerged with the, you know, the quality of consciousness that they had and the artistry that they had after their experiences. Obviously, a lot of the great musicians of the 60s were doing this. But now it's being studied much more meticulously. And to me, I see what's going on now. I think it's part of the psychedelic ransom. It's part of reconnecting with the earth. We are massively out of contact with the earth. I mean, you don't have to look more other than global warming, global heating, global boiling. To me, this is, you know, it is an, we are in a genuinely existential crisis. Our civilization is in an existential crisis. You know, as I look out of my window here, if it wasn't a snowy, misty day, I'd be, I'd be seeing Wall Street right across the East River. I've got, you know, Midtown Manhattan to my right here. I mean, it's, you know, the heart of global capitalism. It's very disturbing to see, you know, everything going on as usual. It's all just the quarterly profits. And while we're dealing with this huge existential crisis. So to me, what something like the psychedelic renaissance being done in a responsible way um, and with a recognition that these substances are sacred substances used by the pre-Columbian cultures uh, of the Western Hemisphere for thousands of years. And if you talk to, say, Mark Plotkin, who's a great uh, anthropologist who spent 30 years in the Amazon, speaks the indigenous languages, I mean, something like ayahuasca, it's just one of, he said, 40 or so different psychedelics that the shamans there use, but they use them in a coherent way. So I think I think we're in desperate need of a reconnection to the earth. We're also obvious, obviously in terms of psychiatry, we're in desperate need of something new. You know, the psychiatric medicine cabinet has been pretty bare for a long time with the Prozac and Zoloft and the antidepressants and so on. But they, you know, they have disturbing side effects. They're not very effective for a lot of people. I'm not saying they're useless. Whereas these things, of course, people come in if they, it's clinical depression or existential distress or addiction to alcohol or tobacco or whatever it may be. And there are amazing results and it's all being scientifically tabulated now. So, so both in terms of dealing with addictions and in terms of dealing with our loss of spiritual connection to the earth. And if we don't regain that, you know, I mean, our civilization is going to be history, isn't it? So, 
it's all hands on deck in terms of waking up our culture to the dire situation we're in. And I think the role of holistic centers, holistic podcasts, you know, is to try, we have to try to educate and wake people up to the fact that there's got to be a profound shift towards a more holistic, ecological, and I would say, for those who are attuned to it, you know, independently, freely spiritual uh, worldview. And if, if that's the way forward, I've always said that this work is essential for a viable and sustainable future for the planet. But how critical is it going to have to get before, you know, how many more wildfires, how many massive icebergs breaking off, etc. before it sinks in. You know, each time there's another huge fire or a massive flood, I think, well, is this what's going to wake people up? And then, you know, a week or two later, it's back to you, back to business as usual, and it's what, it's what up and down on the wall on the stock market and so on. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I do think it's a good thing in general. I, it's certainly, you know, my own journey when I was uh, 20 years old, it was certainly, it opened spiritual doors for me. And so I, I would know there was certain, nothing in the culture around me apart from music and the Beatles and Pink Floyd and all the rest of it that was speaking for that. And, and, you know, in the early 70s, it was the musicians, the rock musicians, who were speaking more about spiritual experience than, than others. Um, but, yeah, it was certainly very helpful for me. And I, I'm a, it, it's a question of using it in the right way as a sacred substance. I've heard the argument that the psychedelic revolution or the, the revolution in the 60s in general benefited from or was enabled by a stable, some would say overly rigid, stayed, stuck cultural position, but nonetheless quite a coherent one. So the table had four legs and a pretty solid top. So in a sense, the revolution had something to tip over, a structure to redefine or to break free from, it, to be in opposition to somehow or to react to. And now, I don't know if you, I, I'm curious if you see it this way, with culture being more fragmented, perhaps, less coherent, if that's the case, what implications does that have for the emerging psycho, psychedelic renaissance? And then a bit related to that, another criticism I, I hear of this idea of waking up the culture reconnect into the earth, etc., is that it's great if everyone does that, but if just some people do it, then they themselves become at the mercy of other people who are not that way. So, for example, one particular culture or country achieves some sort of tipping point of awakening or something like that, and then how do they defend themselves against those in other parts of the world, their neighbors or distant neighbors who may not share that same sense of whatever it is and who might um, choose to take advantage of it uh, militarily in some sort of a sense. So I suppose uh, there's, there are two questions there really to do with the differences in the cultural, uh, cultural base from which the psychedelic revolution or an awakening kind of revolution is coming in the 60s and now and any, any comparisons you have there that it might be of interest but also how to how that relates to i suppose geopolitics well yeah i mean we certainly need all societies to be moving to a more enlightened state but you know you can certainly there are dark forces in the world i was just listening to a podcast about the amazingly brilliant islamic culture uh in uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia, Samarkand and Bukhara in the 13th century. Um, and then along came the Mongols. You know, along came Genghis Khan, completely tore through it all, devastated. And I mean, this was the time of Rumi, you know, Rumi had to go west. I mean, Rumi was able to maintain his amazing spiritual consciousness, even in the midst of this horrendous destruction by the Mongols. But yeah, I mean, look at what just happened in Ukraine. Putin, with his deranged worldview, attacking a totally a non-aggressive country like Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I live in America. You know, America's got this power in the world. And if America can shift in these directions, it can be hugely influential. But you have a small state that uh, 
might have a more pacifist inclination. There could be trouble. But look at Costa Rica. You know, Costa Rica is often taken as an example of Latin America's most enlightened culture. There was a, they got rid of the army years ago. There are more teachers than there are police. They've been environmental pioneers. Um, they have some of the greatest biodiversity. They haven't been attacked <laughs> because they're not they're not next to Russia or something like that. But they have taken a very enlightened path, and they have prospered. Whereas, look at you know, look, look at Mexico, and uh, you know, countless other societies. Like Guatemala went through so many horrendous civil war and mass murders and so on. So, uh, you could certainly argue that <laughs> that Costa Rica is an example of a culture that really moved in a, a more enlightened direction, has benefited it as a result. But you've always, you know. There are aggressive, disturbed people in leadership roles all over the planet. And we've got a long way to go before we arrive at an enlightened world for eons from that, but bit by bit. So, yeah, you know, in terms of, you mean the culture, say, back in the 50s and 60s, there was a more accepted set of values, you mean, the sort of traditional values of uh, family and work and job and uh, all that kind of thing and um, respect for one's elders. And, of course, in Britain, the horrendous class system, which I always find, apart from the weather, <laughs> the most disturbing thing about Britain. And um, I don't know about that. You know, I don't, I'm not sure if, if we are... A, there's more danger of fragmentation. I mean, look here in America, we, what we've got the we've got the tremendous rise of the religious right. You know, eighty percent of the Trump supporters are evangelicals, many of whom believe that uh, he is God's chosen and appointed one. People should our, our reviewers should re research the New Apostolic Reformation which is a whole evangelical movement intent upon um, spiritual warfare and the gaining of power, the godly Christians, as they call it. And Johnson, uh, Speaker Johnson, who's now the Speaker of the House, one of the most powerful political leaders in, in America, is an out-and-out -out dominionist. And they believe that God's decree is that godly Christians should control all the major expressions of society, education, business, culture, etc. They call it the seven mountains. And they're serious about it. Some of it, they really believe this is a spiritual battle. And if you ever watch this unfortunate woman, Paula White, I'm, I'm sorry that she and I share the same so I hope I hope we're not related. Uh, she's a sort of glamorous blonde who's married, married to a rock star, but she does these weird invocations for Trump right before the January the sixth thing. These strange claiming to be invoking angels, and you know the the new apostolic reformation. You know these people think that they're prophets, prophets and apostles who are <coughs> articulating the word of God, <coughs> and that Donald Trump is their is their chosen one. So. You know, we have these very disturbing elements now. That's a, that's a way. I did a big conference on this uh, where the Open Center partnered with City University Graduate Center. We had 600 people at a major conference 16 years ago called Examining the Real Agenda of the Religious Far Right, dealing with exactly this stuff. And the New York Times ignored it. We couldn't get the mainstream media to pay attention to it. And now it's everywhere. And now, of course, it's most of Trump's base. So uh, yeah, I mean we're trying to bring <laughs> trying to bring in new levels of consciousness to society while having these really disturbing retrograde uh, phenomena going on at the same time. So yeah, I, you know, because America is split in these difficult ways. A lot of it's to do with fact, uh, Fox News and, and Trump's you know relentless lying um, and his conviction, you know, from from his his mentor roy Cohn, you know that you just keep on lying and lying and lying and, and eventually enough people will come to believe it and that's what he's done successfully so how do how do you elevate consciousness in a situation like that you've got ascending and descending consciousness so this is all everything that has to be worked out isn't it we're, we're living in very challenging times especially here in america one impulse in response to that is a sort of new byzantium 
model, a kind of contracting of, should we say, enlightenment-minded people, rather than an outward momentum into the society to, to seed it, is uh, to withdraw and to cloister and sequester and uh, you know, make a sort of arc, you know, with, I suppose, one of the Ram Dass's book on the kitchen table of the arc and, you know, think that sort of thing. I don't mean to be so facetious, I'm just trying to be humorous. But that is an impulse. Those two impulses of going out and trying to elevate things and writing it off and withdrawing, those are two impulses that I think sages have followed uh, throughout history, both of those impulses. Do you see a place for that or are you still optimistic to, to engage with the culture and the society? I live in New York, so <laughs> I'm up for dealing with the mainstream. You know, look, I, I spent three and a half years at Finhorn in Scotland there in the 70s, and I'm all in favor of uh, people, you know, coming together. I'd had a very lonely path hitchhiking through South America and California and all these places uh, for years. So for me, it was very bonding, very strengthening. You know, I had lifelong friends to be in the warmth of community of people who shared those values and we're doing something practical and that uh, you know Findholm was into solar panels and wind power and organic agriculture and all of that you know long before the uh, climate crisis became evident so yes I think there's always a I do think there's a need greater need for human community you know the loneliness the isolation that is so much a part of the one of the major medical figures that was it here or over there said that um Loneliness, it has the malefic effect comparable to 15 cigarettes a day in terms of life expectancy. So wasn't that, didn't Britain create a minister for loneliness or something in the cabinet? But I thought that was very good. So yes, but then so people need to come together because they're strengthening, they're soul building. But then, you know, I mean, people I knew who were still there you know, from the 70s, that's their path. But I need to take it out into the world. And of course, in a sense, New York City is the ultimate. I mean, there are big, bigger cities, etc. But it's probably the most influential city in the world. And so, you know, that's what I've been trying to do for 40 years is bring this holistic worldview into the heart of the world's most influential city. And uh it ain't easy, but uh, it's been very worthwhile. So I'm obviously of the school that you can do both. I support Findhorn, and I support all the work that we do in other, other places in, in all the big cities. We need them both. Um, no, I, I think you've got to be optimistic. Um, I mean, what is the point of not being in a way? Uh, ultimately, you've got to have hope. So, hope. And uh, I do. I, I think we can, you know, if you just get into that defeatist mentality, I mean, there was an obnoxious piece in today's New York Times. You know, the consensus at Davos, you know, the big business gathering of world capitalism, the consensus at Davos is that Trump is going to win in November. I mean, what's the use of a, of a headline like that? I mean, that's just feeding negative thinking. As far as I'm concerned, look, it would be a disaster for Trump to win. But that just means that all of us who understand that have to redouble our efforts. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to prevent that man. He is a psychopath. And uh, he's making very clear he will be a dictator if he gets. And we can, it really will be the end of American democracy. And, I, I find, uh, and then, well, you know, take out America. And what have you got less? What happens then to the Ukraine, etc. Or Ukraine. So... Um, yeah, no, I believe that we have to be, uh, stay strong, stay clear, you know, take whatever avenue we can um, to bring positive consciousness to bear on, you know, I've always been a very politically oriented person as well as a spiritual person. So um, I believe we keep on trucking and we exert the maximum influence wherever we can, conferences, podcasts, uh, workshops, talks. TV appearances, everything. We just need to work to redouble our efforts because the danger is really big at this point. One of the ways that you've acted that out, what you've just said there, is through your conferences. And you have organized yeah. many different conferences on many different themes, and they're they're large affairs, they're large scale affairs, international affairs with hundreds of people. And that I think takes quite an enormous amount of energy and vision to bring something like that out of nothing and 
to coordinate so many people together. You can't have a conference just by yourself, obviously. And to get the speakers yeah, yeah. and to, to have the, to the marketing and the whole thing to bring that together at the scale you've done is very significant indeed. I wonder if you have any reflections on your work as a conference um, organizer, a conference creator. Well, I was just in touch with somebody uh, yesterday or last week about um, Jerry Mander and the International Forum on Globalization. Is that a name that means anything to you, Steve? It's a great name. It's his real name, Jerry Mander. But uh, he just died last year, and he was an outstanding man. He he wrote four arguments for the elimination of television in the absence of the sacred. He was, and he pulled together the. Uh, the forum, the International Forum on Globalization and work, the Open Center, working with him back in 2001. We did a major conference with probably 1,500 people um, called Technology and Globalization, A Marriage Made in Heaven or Hell. And at the time when the New York Times was speaking of the unalloyed benefits of globalization, mm -hmm. Of course, this is what led us to lose all our manufacturing jobs in middle America to China and Mexico and, of course, leave the millions of working people in America destitute and then making them vulnerable to to Trump's lies instead of Bernie Sanders' truth. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think that uh, these conferences can be very... They can be very effective, you know. Of course, the good thing about Jerry Mander, he was he was connected to some major funding sources. So I think of another wonderful one we did on the indigenous peoples' resistance to corporate globalization. So I, for me, probably the greatest I've, I've introduced hundreds, if not thousands, of people at events in my life. But probably the greatest honor I ever had was at the beginning of that because it was indigenous people gathered from all over the planet. And Jerry's fundraising contacts meant we could bring in, you know, the Inuit from the Arctic, the Maasai from Africa, the Aboriginal people from Australia, not to mention every kind of North and South Native American person. But, I mean, there was a great drum that they set up on the stage at Cooper Union, this historic hall in New York where Lincoln debated uh, during his presidential years. Um they set up this huge drum and four young Native American guys were beating out the drums and uttering these great cries. And because I was the host, you know, traditionally in indigenous culture, the host welcomes everybody. So I wound up welcoming all of the, the whole indigenous world, you know, the, well, the representatives of the indigenous world. And because, you know, most of the last um, pure resources, water and forests and so on the vast majority of it is in the hands of indigenous people and they are united whether they're tribal leaders from the heart of the amazon or wherever it is they are united this is a spiritual responsibility we have to protect this world and it was very impressive so and then we did another one and uh with uh, called technology and globalization no sorry that was the other one it was um techno utopia it was on the kind of attitudes that come out of Silicon Valley. In fact, they're going to do an event in San Francisco next year honoring Jerry Mander because he did. Because this is the place in San Francisco. You know, that's where you want to do a conference on on techno utopia. So I do think that you know they have an impact. These are these conferences. I mean, whether it's five hundred or a thousand or even just a hundred people, we did the first conference on. Um, on the destruction of the rainforests back in 1985 with the rainforest alliance we did the first conference on socially responsible investing you know which is now pretty widespread or goes under a different name esg so yeah i think this is what we do you know should we chip away i mean it, it does it have the same impact as network television no but um you know, maybe we, you can get all kinds of metaphors, can't you? The hundredth monkey, I don't know about that. But you can say it's a homeopathic dose. You know, we doing this consciousness work, we're like a little homeopathic dose in our culture. Of course, I'm, the scientific establishment will totally dismiss homeopathy as a load of old nonsense. Um, what is it that turns a culture around? I mean, it's a gradual shift in consciousness, isn't it? And, uh, and there are deeper forces at work. There are spiritual forces at work. People, some people would uh, suggest it's not just material forces. 
So it's that whole larger work of shifting consciousness, shifting values, shifting vision. And uh, I don't think we can just leave, you know, you go off and do your own thing and you have your own, like the Essenes or something like that, you know, 2,000 years ago uh, in, uh, in Palestine. Um, you just do what you can. And, you know, whatever, whatever your path is, you just follow it and you do it to the best of your ability. And, you know, I look back on 40 years of New York and probably we have, I don't know, I don't know if you figured it out exactly, but maybe 400,000 people came through the open center. Uh, it's nothing compared to the, you know, the 600 million, the 16 million people in greater New York, not to mention the 300 million in America. But it has an impact because a lot of those people, you know, they are alert, aware, conscious, creative people who bring it into their work, whatever, whether they're architects, psychotherapists, teachers, housewives, you know, whatever they are. Uh, people bring this work in. And, you know, the work I've been doing for years with the Western esoteric tradition, I mentioned those esoteric quests. I mean, it used to be 30 years ago, all of that was considered totally weird, crazy little cults, the Rosicrucians who, you know, built a bunch of uh, something that looks like ancient Egypt in San Jose, California, it ads in the back of Popular Mechanics magazine. Since then, since we've started doing that, um, the Western esoteric tradition has become one of the hottest elements within the humanities. It's like we are rediscovering uh, a beautiful and wonderful part of our own Western culture that has been marginalized, whether it was the Inquisition, the church, the scientific establishment, innumerable wars. You know, you've got to engage in an act of spiritual excavation to bring this all up to the surface again. But that's what has made it so enjoyable. And so now I look back on starting that. I did that first conference in Chesky Krumlov in Bohemia, the southern Bohemian mecca of alchemists, way back in the mid 90s when. Uh, if anybody went to Prague, they would, uh, went to the Czech Republic. They tended to go just go to Prague. But now, you know, look at the way that has proliferated. I can't say it's me or what we've done, but it certainly played a role. I mean, there's a lot of work going on at the University of Amsterdam and all kinds of other places. Um, but the New York Times actually did a front page story. Well, I don't know if it's front page or not, but did a whole story on the university's exeters new master's degree in, on the occult and witchcraft or something, which is uh, not my favorite subject, but it's really a continuation of the work founded by Nicholas Goodrick Clark, who established the center at Exeter maybe 10 years ago for the study of Western esotericism that did extremely well, had more graduate students, uh, more people going from master's to PhD than any other program in the university, but then Nicholas tragically died died very quickly and the whole thing ended with him but i mean i'm glad exeter is still pursuing something of this ilk and it's getting major play from the new york times so you know you never know how these things will will spread out look you know we're we're all looking for something well we're not all but a lot of us are looking for something deeper than just this crass consumer-based materialism and this endless focus on economic growth and productivity when we we live in a finite planet and all the money is going to one percent and what, three billionaires now own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of American society? I mean, this is madness. It's not sustainable. So I think, yeah, I think this whole consciousness movement, the holistic cultural impulse, spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it, I think it has a big role to play. And yeah, that's where my path has been. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's not as effective as being a TV anchor or something well they they have limited amounts of what they can say you know politics and the mass media are obviously more effective but you know where this creative stream and maybe it was a rivulet maybe it's a stream maybe it'll grow into a river that can increasingly fertilize and water you know the arid spiritual landscape of so much of the contemporary world you have had your finger on the pulse for some decades and many of the themes or topics that you've promoted and uh, supported, etc., have become quite mainstream. You mentioned just two or three of them there. They were niche, kooky, fringe, and they've become quite mainstream. Conscious investing, uh, to name just one, you, you name several. 
it sounds to me like you think the psychedelic renaissance that's happening now is one, if you want, hot area. Hot in the sense of it's where some action's happening, it's where there's some, some, something emerging. Um, you're nodding, I see. Are there any other areas that you, you intuit or have observed are, if you want, trends in the making or something that may be breaking out? Looking at right now, what's you? Well, of course, you know, we've gone through the huge mindfulness thing, haven't we? You know, mindfulness, mindfulness is a cure for everything under the sun. I think it's gone, it's gone a little too far. We're sort of past that. I mean, I'm a fan of mindfulness, but uh, it's been presented as a panacea for everything under the sun, whether it's corporate productivity or wherever it is. Um, what is. I'm not sure. You know, it's definitely the one that is busting out all over is the psychedelic renaissance right now. You just see it constantly. Um, I, I, there's nothing coming to mind for me in, in some other major areas that... Uh, but, what you know, I just you were saying that there was a phrase that came to mind that I remember, which I remember E.F. Schumacher, you know, the, the great author of... Uh, Small is beautiful, a true pioneering economist who was also one of the funniest lecturers. That guy, I remember hearing him in 1976 where he gave a presentation on the state of the world and he gave a devastating portrait of what was happening on the planet. And he had everybody rolling in the aisles. I mean, he was incredibly funny. Now, somebody like that, <laughs> that's an outstanding human being. I really like the EF, uh, EF Schumacher. But he used to say, look, people call me a crank because he was way ahead of the time. So. And he said, but you know what? We need a crank to cause a revolution. <laughs> to get. So that's, I think that's the answer. So-called cranks, yes, call me a crank if you like, but cranks create revolutions. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. Nothing else is coming to mind in, in terms of um, some major fresh element in the consciousness scene that has comparable charisma right now to the whole psychedelic renaissance i think that's the one because i'm just seeing it written up everywhere um but uh, i'll probably think of three after we conclude our uh, our conversation what about ai well you know i know very little about ai it see i see the dangers of it i see the benefits of it I and mean, then obviously you know, highly developed. I know I've met people who are doing work on uh, the connection between mindfulness and AI, and I'm, I'm glad that people are bring, trying to bring consciousness into that world. Obviously, brilliant machine learning with far greater information at its disposal than you or I or any, any kind of any brilliant human being, more than we could ever have. It's going to have a massive capacity for processing intelligence. And of course, it starts being used on the battlefield or with smart weapons and all that, you know, we're already seeing with the drones. It just, it just seems to be, I, I'm certainly no authority on it. I know very little about it really, other than it seems extremely dangerous. It seems like it should be regulated. I know there are efforts being made to regulate it right now. Then there's always the danger of some rogue operator getting a hold of it and using it for some dire purposes. And it's it, to me, it, it looks like it's like nuclear weapons. It's a, it's another instance of humanity having more knowledge than it does wisdom, and that and that's why we need, uh, you know, we need this work that you and I and thousands of others are doing to try to return some kind of wisdom to our world, so it's not just runaway technology and knowledge in pursuit of profit for a tiny percentage of the population. I mean, people will look back on this era as an absolutely deranged worldview with endless consumer production and all going to a minute fragment of the population who are then misusing it to push their political agenda. So, um, yeah, these are difficult times, but we need, it's all hands on deck, isn't it? And, uh, I appreciate what you do with your podcasts and I do my thing and I'm sure many of our listeners are wherever they are, are you know, trying to bring consciousness into their into their environment. And um, so whether you're a 
in a small town in you know in the north of England or uh, or in a little hamlet in upstate New York you know you never know what will come out of these places yeah. Omega Institute came out of a hamlet in upstate New York actually and, and now it's the kind of East Coast Esalen so you you know you never know what will emerge when there's vision when there's passion where there's intelligence where there's creativity and where's that <laughs> You know that I mean I I think we, I talked about it in one of our previous conversations, but I, I hitchhiked to Machu Picchu from Canada when I was twenty three. You know I was up in the mountains of Peru and Bolivia for months, and then I came back down again to sea level, and I saw industrial civilization with fresh eyes. Um, that's what that kind of experience gives you, and it, even though it was only a fairly small city in Peru, I had a keeper. I saw, I have one of those moments of intuitive clarity where I saw that Western industrial civilization is both destroying the biosphere or wrecking the biosphere and wrecking our own psyches as well, both. And that we have to build an alternative to it. And really that's what my life has been about, trying to create a more holistic and ecological and spiritual alternative to this dead end worldview that is trashing the planet and like I say, you know, we're in an existential crisis here with global heating. And what is our role as people who are not necessarily directly politically involved, but good luck to the people who are active politicians. Um, but what can we all do to turn the society away from this highway to hell? Who was it? Was it ACDC or somebody who, it's not my kind of music, but there was, I know that song, Highway to Hell. And uh, that does seem the most apt metaphor for what we're on right now. And it, it is as that film, Don't Look Up, or what will it take for people to wake up to realize that we need to shift the direction away from us producing global warming? But it's not just where do we go? What is the positive direction that we go in? And that's where I think our work comes in and giving people a model and a set of values uh, you know, a reconnection to a sacred earth, a reconnection to the inner spirit within the, each of us, and a focus on uh, on well-being and uh, community and uh, a flourishing culture, and not this relentless race for uh, endless money. And of course, that's that's the shadow side of America par excellence. America's filled with you live, you know, you look over in Britain, you think, oh, Americans are idiots. <laughs> How could they be electing these people? Um, although, uh, of course, <laughs> people used to say the Brits used to pride themselves on being smarter than uh, Americans, and then Brexit came along. <laughs> that was the end of that. But um, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of wonderful people out there. And uh, I have a lot of faith in all the good work that they're doing. And you never know who you're going to talk to next or who will be in the next workshop or who will listen to the next podcast who it might influence. And we just keep on tracking and we don't sink into despair. That doesn't help anybody or hopelessness. Or, oh, the people at Davos all think that Trump's going to be elected. I don't think that way. That's just going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you we do everything we can to turn the world in the right direction. And uh what else can we do? So I want to thank you for what you do, Steve. I've really enjoyed our conversations. And, uh, you know, the UK has a special place in my heart, always will. And uh, it's been fun to talk to you. Yes, it has. And as for a rogues gallery, we didn't get through many of them. We might have to do this again in six months or so. And, and I know you've got a long yeah, list. But, well, people like, you know, I... This is George Revelyan, who was the founder of the Reekin House. And uh, he was an outstanding guy. He he looked like a Sir George. <laughs> he never wanted anybody to call him Sir, but he's the only person I would ever have been willing to call Sir. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I've mentioned E.F. Schumacher, Sir George. I mean, these these were some outstanding. Sir George Revelyan was a real pioneer of the whole consciousness spiritual work in the UK and a really great man, one of the most... Uh, brilliant orators that man had memorized thousands of poems the living word he called it and he i mean his his presentations were just filled with living vibrant poetry he was all heart he was a, a truly great guy 
And uh, yeah, so the, yes, we may have to do it again, Steve. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people we didn't get to. Great. Well, let's hope yeah. we do that. Ralph White, thank you okay. very much. Thank you. All the best. Have a lovely evening. Okay. Bye bye then. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.